Eric is one of the most amazing men I've probably ever met in my life. That he's, he's dropped a pebble in the middle of the pond uh, and those ripples have spread right to the edge and I think a lot of us are very grateful for having met him. I wish there were more people like him around. But without them, you know, we wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been as, as lucky as we have been. It's like, like a big, big happy family, we all are. He has a passion, he wants to do something with his life, uh, he wants to be inventive, he wants to give, he, wants, he, 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 is, he is an enjoyer of life. He's charismatic, he's extremely intelligent, he, is, uh, he will try anything and everything. Maybe he was before his time. He gave me a sense of worth, they gave Sorry? me a sense of worth, they gave, I've, I've said this to them since you know, in, in recent years, um, they gave me an identity. I mean, he's 80 years old and he's still giving parties. That's the way it was always with him. Any reason for a party, we would celebrate it. There's another saying that comes to mind that uh, a person is one in a million. I think Ricky is one in several, several million. Ricky, it's been a privilege and a pleasure to have you as a brother-in-law, yeah. and I can only toast that the future years, you've got many, many more to come of health well, and happiness. Well Thank you. My name is Erica and I've got a pair of a grandpa. Who is the collector who collects these things? Who collects cars and carts? Who collects Christmas things? Who who rides two-seater aeroplanes? Who has a Lexus car? Who has a wife called Marion and lives on a farm? The only answer is Grandpa. I'm Caroline, and I was fostered by um, Eric and Marion uh, when I was 14, when they were living in Arundel. Uh, I think I was one of 24 children. But I was seven years of age and I was in a children's home and this young dashing couple, and they were incredibly young, teenagers almost, not quite, but certainly out of their teenage years just, and they walked in and at that instant I knew that something special was going to happen. Um, I was at um, boarding school for a few years and, and every weekend I spent with them and then um, I went back to my own parents because they were settled down for a while. And then um, <coughs> things uh, fell apart again. So there was the safety net. <laughs> well, they're, they're wonderful people, and Eric is who I know as daddy. They wanted to adopt a young girl, and they went round looking, as they do, and they saw this young boy, and, and Pa said, I'll have him. We, we lived in the Priory, which is part of Arundel Castle, a unique place, a wonderful place. So our childhood was quite unbelievable. It was just amazing, arrived there um, in, on a dark night and the wind blowing and went into this beautiful, s serene atmosphere and was just enveloped in this love. I'm probably going to get quite emotional uh, by um, Eric and Marion. And they've always been mummy and daddy to me ever since. I never stopped calling them that. We arrive in mass as the Mad Priory with an eccentric father, dogs, cats, guinea pigs, everything, and 27 kids running right in this big place. We had our own little theatre, which at the time, then we had a little youth club there. We had our own chapel. We had, and they, yeah, it, it's never left Arundel. They, they will never forget the Priory. They had a Dutch room, a special Dutch room for us. He did a big surprise on St. Nicholas Day. I was shocked when I opened the door, but there was St. Nicholas for me. It's the 5th uh, of uh, December. They did, spe did specialist things. He, yeah, we feel like a family. But, yeah, the thing I'm thinking of, the picture I have, is the Armstrong Siddeley car packed with children. Layers of children. I was one of the eldest. I was the eldest girl, and, and Blair was the eldest boy at that time. Um, and we had all this tribe of little ones running after us. And we used to get piled into this Humber, 
and driven down to the seaside um, for the day in, in the summer. There was a switchback. And we used to go down the switchback. Um, and we all used to scream, oh, let's go down the switchback. So we used to go down one day. I think it was Lorraine who was nearest the door, and we, we did lose one that day. We went back and got her. But it was all part of the fun. <laughs> and there was the incidents like that which do stand out in your memory. And uh, he used to instigate these really bizarre um, singing rituals on the way just to keep everyone entertained. And one particular favourite was Suck a Lemon, which that was it. It was Suck a Lemon and it was sung for about 20 minutes all the way to the beach. Could you sing it now? It was just, um, oh dear. <laughs> Suck a lemon, suck a lemon, suck a lemon every day. If you want to suck a lemon, suck a lemon every day. And we'd have, um, what were the favourite? Tunny fish sandwiches, um, sunny spread, you know, all these names which are magic in your childhood, you know. And, um, and they just love me. People are going to cry. <laughs> love me. Um, we used to go on holiday. One of the holidays was um, at Hassocks near Brighton, and it was actually, um, it was a ploy really, it was a holiday, but it was actually a ploy to get us to clear this woodland for the nuns at the convent. Um, so in the day we cleared the woodland, which was brilliant, it was brilliant fun, and the nuns were wonderful. And um, so we cleared the woodland, and then at night uh, we slept under canvas, and um, but after all the hard day's work, we used to all get washed and changed, and we'd, we cooked our food outside. It was a real camping trip. And then we'd all get washed and changed and pile into the Bedford, and we'd go ice skating or bowling or the cinema, or whatever. And that was lovely. We lived in part of a castle with an eccentric man who was an inventor. He invented concentrated orange juice. He invented Norfolk Punch. He had the first all-night club in Bognor Regis from a dilapidated old hotel. So many things that he's done. He was a very determined person to give the young something to do. I mean, he had a youth club at, at the Priory um, to, to give the, the children of Arundel and the older ones at the Priory um, something to do. Um, and then he decided to open this club for the same reason. He's like a, an entrepreneur in the, in the 60s. I mean, some of the stuff he did was for the first ever. The Shoreline Club, the first ever. And because it was the world's first teenage hotel, and absolutely unthinkable that in the 60s, somebody would have the audacity to join two hotels together and have it segregated, you know, boys and girls, and, but it was so successful, uh, people actually came from uh, all over Europe and paid very good money, had a wonderful time, and he was doing things in that teenage hotel. It was basic rules, you know, there was no uh, sex, um, there was no drugs, uh, and there were no adults. Simple as that. There were a couple of adults to sort of you know, modify the system. And in fact, basically, it was run by young people. I first met Eric at the uh, Shoreline Hotel at Bognor Regis when I was about 16 and a friend of mine said you must go to this place, it's, it is unique in, in the world, there's never been a hotel run by teenagers for teenagers uh, and I found it was the most extraordinary place. Eric was booking uh, some acts that went on to become very, very famous. Uh, Elton John, David Bowie played there long before they were famous uh, on a tiny little stage. Uh, he got the whole place together by uh, bringing in young people from the area, and in my case from well outside the area, to work in the summer holidays and weekends. Um, and I remember one group who turned up, the Corncrackers uh, from Wales, who said, oh, we've heard about this place. He said, can we play? And Eric said, yes, you can, but I can't pay you, and you'll have to make your own beds. And they thought, well, that's all right. Making our own beds is not no problem at all. What they didn't realize when they got to the bedroom, he literally meant, making their own beds. There were planks of wood, four by two, hammers, nails, and before they could go to sleep, they had to make their own beds. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a truly incredible place, and I think uh, Eric was certainly an inspiration to all of us. He could get us to work 24 hours a day for absolutely nothing and be grateful for it. He could persuade people to do anything he wanted to. Yeah. 
his charm personified. I can remember we just had the phone installed. It was soon after the war when it was very difficult to get the phone installed. We just got the phone installed and I can remember sort of standing on the landing of the, of the house that we were living at the time. Ricky was on the phone and I could hear him saying, yes sir, yes sir, I think we can do business. And this is, this is before they were married. <coughs> and I found out later that he'd bought one of the Navy's derelict warships. The only time I got involved was when I was working for Ranks. And Erica had the idea, I don't know how he came to think about it, but the film transit cases were boxes of steel or some such metal, and each reel of film was encased in a, a round tin. And he said, they must be frightfully heavy, which they, of course, they were. And he said, do you think anybody would be interested if we made a, a lighter one, easier to transport? I said, yeah. So eventually Eric came across with, I can't tell what plastic it was, but anyway, it, it, the, the, the film fit into it perfectly. So I said, now look, I'm taking this back to the buyer. I said, well, is it strong enough to, to, to take all the transit troubles? Yeah, he said, look, you can stand on your desk and jump on it. I said, oh, that's fine. So I took it into Rank's buyer, and of course the first thing he said was, how strong is it? I said, well, stand on your desk and jump at it. Guess what? <laughs> it broke. <laughs> at Arundel Priory, Ricky managed to resurrect a very ancient recipe for um, a drink, which I think he called Arundel Sack. Uh, the only bottles that were genuine were those with a, a bay leaf floating in them. It was a lovely drink. <clears throat> Of course, what does he do when he goes to um, Royal Manor Hall? He discovers an ancient recipe for Norfolk Punch. And he puts the Norfolk Punch <coughs> on the menu. <coughs> of course, if that wasn't uh, enough, after um, Royal Manor Hall, we have um, the Collector's World that, uh, down on market. Uh, which I think is purely a reflection of, uh, of Ricky's life. It uh, shows that it... Uh, it never pays to throw anything away because the collection there is absolutely unbelievable. He was showing Paul Martin around the collector's world and Paul was asking what were his uh, most valuable collection. And he pointed to a couple of cinema seats that he'd got there. And Paul said, two cinema seats, the most you know, valuable item of your collection but compared with all this lot. He said, yeah. <coughs> When Marion and I married, we had our honeymoon down in Lymouth, and we went to a cinema in Lymouth to see a film. And I heard several years later that the cinema was going to be demolished. He said, and I went down there, and I purchased the two seats in the circle that Marion and I sat in to see the film on our honeymoon, and they are the two seats that we sat in at the cinema. And as many of you know, of course, he's been involved in many um, varied business ventures, some of which are really quite quirky. Some of you will remember uh, filling up uh, bags uh, with woodworm killer. And of course, who can ever forget the coffins under the house? Uh, but we have all become so much richer through this experience. We've been involved so intimately in, in so many of the, and they've been fun. Absolutely, they weren't really work, they were really what uh, makes our family quite unique. Even when we were at the Priory, his generosity was instilled in us by example, because he insisted that every tramp that came to the door, and you remember this, uh, they were all given uh, a mug of tea and a sandwich. And so these men, these homeless men who went on on their journey, uh, they went away knowing that they had a friend there, always, who would look after them. The biggest heart ever. And the thing is about all of us, I think, who lived through that experience, We've all got our stories to tell, and I can honestly say that all of us feel that we've been blessed by this experience, one way or another, we have. You wouldn't know uh, in any way, shape or form that, that he's 80. Chronologically he is, uh, mentally he certainly isn't and physically he doesn't look it uh, but to still be uh, flying planes and inventing things and doing things uh, and making plans for the future and why not um, I think it's absolutely fantastic so uh, 
Uh, Eric, uh, for, for all of us, I think a great pleasure having known you and a great inspiration. Lots of love. Lots of love. I wish them all the best and I hope to see you in Holland, perhaps when my mum will have it, her 90th. <laughs> right. Love you, Daddy. Very happy birthday and as I said in your card, I'm watching the space to see what your next project is. <laughs> and I love you very much and Mummy and thank you. Thank you so much for everything. I've learned all sorts of things about myself that I didn't know. I've just been hearing them. <laughs> but uh, um, it's wonderful to be, have you with us and to thank you. I'd like to thank you. And, of course, the biggest jewel that I've got is Mama, who's been 20, 55 years. <laughs> Good years. Good years. Yes. I, I, I get all the credit. She does all the work. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm Tom, and here's my poem for Grandpa. Why do we love Grandpa? We love him because he is special. We love him because he is kind and generous. We love him because he is funny. We love him because he is 80 today. We love, we love him because he is our Grandpa. For he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow.